Hello team and welcome to an extra extra. This is like a book club extra for ATP Geopolitics. My name is Jonathan M.S. Pierce and I'm going to read to you from a book today. I am a, a third of the way, two fifths of the way through The Bomber Mafia by a Malcolm Gladwell, who is a fantastic thinker, a tale of innovation and obsession. What is The Bomber Mafia? Well, if I can give you the sort of the basic ground grounding to the book, it's about, I think it's going to be about, because I'm not quite there yet, but there's a chap called Norden who invented the bomb site on bombers that allowed you to do an incredibly complex set of calculations, or you didn't do the calculations, it did it for you with gyroscopes and all sorts of variables that allowed you as, as a bombardier in an aircraft, in a bomber, to calculate given the speed the aeroplane is going, the height it is, uh, the, the size of the target, the wind speed, the the temperature, because warmer air is more expanded further away, so molecules are further away from each other. Colder air, it's more compact, so there's more air resistance. So all of these things that would take into account, all of these things, because you're 30,000 feet, and your height, depending on what height you're at, but if you're 30,000 feet up in the air, and you're looking down, and you're just, you're dropping a bomb or a set of bombs, it's it's absolute guesswork you know, with all of those variables, if you don't have something to help you. So basically, bombing was kind of initially just kind of flat and everywhere, because we have no way of being able to, to do precision with our with our dropping of these munitions. And in reading this book, I've, I've come to realise how important this moment, well, what Malcolm Gladwell says is the invention of the bomb site was one of the top 10 inventions, you know, of the of the 20th century and it's a really big claim but he says when you talk about the amount of people who died when you're talking about you know wars etc etc and he actually puts it all together it's like this was a seriously big invention but people just don't realize how important it was so then he's talking it's a bit i'm on at the moment is the idea that the it, basically the u.s air force as it was before it was u.s air force was part of the army and but they wanted to be separate they wanted to be different so they had these guys who were kind of the the Godfathers, if you like, called the Bomber Mafia, right? And there's like a dozen people who are just super Im important in this kind of field of, of running the, the Air Force as was and were doing a lot of thinking, thought experiments, uh, because they were really modern and cutting edge. The, the whole, you know, where the Army and Navy were steeped in tradition, these guys were, this was the, these guys were the new kids on the block and they wanted to do, do things differently and sort of break the molds. And they, they were, trying to work out what well, initially they were they were looking at the US and there was a, a a flood I think in Pennsylvania that knocked out a factory and that factory was the only place really that made springs for propellers so because of that flood the airplane industry came to a grind, grinding halt in the US in like 1936 and they're like oh that's interesting so then they kind of the thought experiment came about that well, if we hit a factory that does that then we can knock out like the ability to make these things, right? In this case, aeroplanes. Okay, well, thought experiment. What? How could if we were doing a bombing run from Toronto? What could we knock out with just a few bombs, right? And it, it was a case of okay, we could knock out aqueducts and and bridges and factories and ma magnesium factories and so on and so forth. And they're like. Just with precision bombing, you could cripple the army without having to send like millions of people to their deaths. And this is kind of revolutionary. Now for one to the, to the Second World War, where they're involved in bombing with the RAF. And we have the situation where the RAF were skeptical of this kind of bomb site. They, they didn't want it. So what they did is they'd fly at night uh, so they wouldn't be hit. And they didn't need to fly in a day because they weren't worried about hitting particular targets they were just doing area bombing and this is why i'm telling you all this because it's so relevant to looking at what ukraine as a kind of extension of nato and you could argue as an extension of the u.s um, kind of military doctrine you can really see like ukraine versus russia in terms of the American way of thinking versus actually here the British way of thinking and actually the German way of thinking too, but really the British way of thinking. 
And where we've seen these strikes on Lviv recently and taking out and, and Kyiv, like right throughout the war, civilian infrastructure being hit, understanding that actually it's quite normal in military doctrine to want to absolutely ab- annihilate civilian targets to try and break the spirit. But actually that's completely inept thinking based on what we know from data. Uh, and I'm going to go into that. So I'm, go- I'm going to read you some of this book and give you, hopefully, you know, fair use and all that. You you will go out and say, all right, I'm going to buy this. But I love this book because, A, it's really well written. Malcolm Gladwell is great. But it's a thin book. It's sm- small. The pages have wide margins and there aren't that many words on the pages. And I do so much reading. In fact, I don't anymore because I don't have time. I'm so busy that when it comes to books like that, brilliant. I can read that really quickly. So that's a bonus. So returning or starting with this quote, I think this kind of sums up what I was just saying. They came up with this uh, report and we see then that 17 bombs, if dropped in the right spots, will not only take out practically all the electric power of the entire metropolitan area, but will prevent prevent the distribution of outside power. 17 bombs. Conventional wisdom was that you'd have to bomb the whole city, reduce it to rubble with wave upon wave of costly and dangerous bombing attacks. Fairchild's point was, why would you do that if you could use your intelligence and the magic of the Norden bomb site to disable a city with a single strike? And then they went on to, you know, to work out uh, how they could, you know, take take out America as a thought experiment. Their report was the AWPD-1. So, so the bomber, bomber mafia went to Washington, this is, I think, before the war started, and produced an astonishing document that would serve as a template for everything the United States did in the air war. The document is titled Air War Plans Division 1, AWPD-1. It lays out in exacting detail how many planes the US would need, a fighters, bombers, transport planes, and how many pilots, how many tons of explosives, and the targets in Germany for all those bombs, chosen according to the choke point theory, 50 electrical power plants, 47 transportation networks, 27 synthetic oil refineries, 18 aircraft assembly plants, six aluminium plants, and six sources of magnesium. And this astonishing set of projections was produced just in nine days, start to finish, the kind of superhuman feat that is only possible if you had spent the previous 10 years in the seclusion of central Alabama waiting for your chance. The bomber mafia was ready for war. And then it comes on to talk about this chap, Ira Eker, who was a graduate of this this school of thought, the Bomber Mafia. And he was then called to Casablanca to meet with Winston Churchill, Roosevelt and the top brass to, to talk about this idea that actually the what was happening is they were doing bombing campaigns in the daytime and uh, – the British, the RAF were just not up for that and they wanted to do it at night time and just do area bombing. And the Americans were like, yeah, not so sure. We want to do precision bombing. And it just came to a head. So uh, here, here we are. The RAF, Royal Air Force, the ideas that had so enthralled Ica and his classmates at Maxwell Field, so this pre- idea of precision bombing, did not have quite the same effect on the other side of the Atlantic. The British were sceptical skeptical about precision bombing. They'd never fallen in love with the Norden bomb site. They never got tantalised by the possibility of dropping a bomb into a pickle barrel from 30,000 feet. The bomber mafia said that you break the will of your enemy by crippling it economically by carefully and skillfully taking out the aqueducts and the propeller spring factories so that the enemy is incapable of going on. When I'm reading this to you, think about what the Ukrainians are doing and what the Russians have been doing. They believed that modern bombing technology allowed you to narrow the scope of war. The British disagreed. They thought the advantage of having fleets of bombers was that you could broaden the scope of war. They called it area bombing, which was a euphemism for a bombing strategy in which you didn't really aim at anything in particular. You just hit everything you could before flying home. Area bombing is not done in daylight because if you aren't bombing at anything specific, why do you need to see anything? And it was explicitly aimed at civilians. All right, this is really important. So don't think the British come out well from this. Um, but uh, I guess you have to go kind of through this evolution, don't you? And it was explicitly aimed at civilians. It said you should hit residential neighbourhoods and keep coming night after night in wave after wave until your enemy's cities are reduced to rubble. Then the will of the enemy is going to sink so low that it will just give up. When the British wanted a better euphemism for what they were doing, they called it morale bombing. Breaking the spirit, isn't it? Uh, bombing with the intent to destroy the homes and cities of your enemy and reduce your enemy's population to a state of despair. 
Uh, the British thought the American bomber mafia was crazy. Why were they taking all the risks of flying during the day against targets too hard to hit? The British were trying to win a war, and it seemed to them that the Americans were holding an undergraduate philosophy seminar. So, at Casablanca, Churchill said to FDR, enough, you're doing it our way now. And in panic, General Arnold summoned his commander in Europe, Ira Ica, to tell him the bad news. Area bombing had won the day. But he wasn't going to give up easily. So, basically, what he had to do is produce a document that wasn't very long. He knew that uh, Churchill would only read a one-page document, and he had to get everything uh, across to him. So he wrote this document to try and convince him to change his mind. So what did he could write? The most basic argument he could come up with. I'd said that if the British bombed them by night and the Americans by day, bombing them thus around the clock will give the devils no rest. So it's like you can have your night area bombing, but we'll continue to do our precision day bombing. When he got to that point in the memo, Churchill repeated the line to himself as if he were trying to understand the logic. Then he turned to Eker. He said, you have not convinced me now that you are right, but you have convinced me you should have a further opportunity to prove your case. So when I see your president at lunch today, I shall say to him that I withdraw my objection and my request that you join the RAF in night bombing, and I shall suggest that you be allowed to continue for a time. Americans got a reprieve by the skin of their teeth. Well, I'm going to now look at just the idea between area bombing and precision bombing because I think this is really worth looking at because it is pertinent to the Ukraine war. So Marshall Harris, that is Bomber Harris, the in charge of the UK, uh, in charge of the RAF, sorry, bombers of the RAF, was steadfast, had a steadfast belief in the power of morale bombing and that must have offended Ica or the very least baffled him, because what had the British just been through? The Blitz. So this is after the Blitz. So the British had been through the Blitz where the, where the Germans did this to London, right? They area bombed London. And the British kind of learnt from that, but didn't learn from it. They're like, oh, here are the lessons from that, but we're not going to apply it to Germany. And we'll, we'll come on to this. So the Blitz was a textbook example of area bombing. On September the 4th, 1940, Hitler had declared the hour will come when one of us will break and it will not be the National Socialist Germany. And in the fall of 1940, he sent German bombers thundering across the skies above London, dropping 50,000 tonnes of high explosive bombs and more than a million incendiary devices. Hitler believed that if the Nazis bombed the working class neighbourhoods of East London, they would break the will of the British population. And because the British believed the same theory, they were terrified that the Blitz would cost them the war. The British government projected that between between three and four million Londoners would flee the city. The authorities even took over a ring of psychiatric hospitals outside of London to handle what they expected to be a flood of panic and psychological casualties. But what actually happened? Not that much. The panic never came. As a British government film of 1940 described it, London raises her head, shakes the debris of the night from her hair and takes stock of the damage done. London has been hurt during the night. The sign of a great fighter in the ring is, can he get up from the floor after being knocked down? London does this every morning. The psychiatric hospitals were switched over to military use because no one showed up. Some women and children were evacuated to the countryside as the bombing started, but by and large, people stayed in the city. And as the blitz continued, as the German assaults grew heavier, the British authorities began to observe, to their astonishment, not just courage in the face of bombing, but also something closer to indifference. Right, now go to uh, Kiev, right, and think about the bombings and the air raid sirens that go off in Kiev. At the beginning, everyone's rushing to air, sh air raid shelters and panicking, and then as time goes on, people become somewhat blasé about it. But also, it, it brought the people of Kiev, it brought the people of Ukraine together. Rather than breaking the spirit, it solidified the spirit of the Ukrainians. And this is what we learn from the Blitz. Um, so, to continue, the Imperial War Museums later interviewed many survivors of the Blitz, including a woman named Elsie Elizabeth Foreman. As she described it, we used to go into the shelter all the time and then they petered off a little bit. We got a bit blasé, I suppose you might say, and we stayed in bed some of the time. But we still used to go dancing. If there was an air raid on, if anyone wanted to leave, they could and all that. Uh, and, and the same at the pictures. If we went to the pictures, we used to just sit there. We never used to move and got out or anything until the actual time when we were bombed out twice, I think. We weren't actually bombed out the first time, just the glass. 
one of my sisters, she came home and she was sweeping the glass from the front because all the windows came in, but she swept it onto the into the curb. And my eldest sister came out and that this was during an air raid and the all clear hadn't gone. And they had this terrific row because my sister had put my oldest sister's best high heel shoes on, which were very hard to get in those days. Same as silk stockings were. Bombs were dropping all over the place. And there were two, these two having a row over a pair of shoes and sweeping the glass at the same time. It turns out that people were a lot tougher and more resilient than anyone expected. And it also turns out that maybe if you bomb another country day in and day out, it doesn't make the people you're bombing give up and lose faith. Maybe it just makes them hate you, their enemy, even more. Boom, there you go. The area bombing advocates had this cleverly deceptive word they used to describe the effect of their bombing, de-housing, as if you could destroy a house without disturbing its occupants. But if my house is gone, doesn't that make me more dependent on my government? not more inclined to turn on my government. That is such uh, an interesting statement there. So if, I am, if, I, if my spirit is broken, if you like, rather than turn on my government and say, let's stop this war, let's, let's just give up, I turn to my government for solace and for sp support, and I, I rely on my government. It almost solidifies the whole, the whole kind of national edifice like uh, politically speaking but also as a as a group of people yeah i think that's that's really good stuff here from um from malcolm gladwell historian tammy biddle takes a long view on area bombing quote i think we've seen this over and over again in the history of bombing we've seen that the state the target state if we're talking about coercive bombing long-range coercive bombing finds ways of absorbing the punishment if it's really determined to do so. When Blitz survivor Sylvia Joan Clark was asked whether she ever thought the Germans might win the war, she replied, No, I never thought that. I'm very proud to be English, and I thought they'll never beat us. Never. I had that in my heart that if I worked and I helped everybody, we'd get there in the end. I used to say this to people. It's no use being down. I had a home. I've had a mother. I've had a father. And I've lost them. But I've made up my mind, nobody's going to get me down. I'm going to survive. And I'm to work hard and be proud that England will be England again. Now, replace England with the word Ukraine there, and you'll get a sense of what Ukrainians must be thinking in light of these attacks that we've seen over the year, over the year and a half coming on for, in terms of civilian infrastructure being hit and trying to break the spirit of the Ukrainians. Once they tallied up the damage, the British determined that more than 43,000 people had been killed and tens of thousands injured. More than a million buildings were damaged or destroyed, and it didn't work. Not on London or Londoners, it did not crack their morale. And despite that lesson, just two years later, the Royal Air Force was proposing to do the exact same thing to the Germans. Ira Eker said that the RAF Marshal Harris when they were living together, had discussions, though I'm guessing arguments would be a better term. They talked long into the night, and once he could turn to Harris and made this exact point. I asked Harris if the bombing of London uh, had affected the morale of the British. He said it made them work harder. But in the case of Germans, however, he thought that the reaction was different because they were a different breed from the British. To Ica and the rest of the bomber mafia, the British attitude made no sense. So it's this idea that, that the Germans were just a different sort of people. So this kind of data we have from the from the Blitz, it was it was down to the British just being stiff up a lip and, and resilient, and the Germans would not be like that at all. And of course, this is complete nonsense. Uh, the British had their own version of the bomber mafia uh, with an equally dogmatic set of views about how air power ought to be used. Actually, the word mafia is not quite right. More like a single booming mafioso, a godfather, and his name was Frederick Lindemann. So Lindemann was this guy who was the best mate of of Winston Churchill, and where Churchill was kind of chaotic, not good with numbers, drank a lot. You know, this guy was very particular in what he ate. It was really organized, mathematically a genius, all this kind of stuff. He was scientific. But in the in the era of bombing, he threw his science away and just went with kind of these gut intuitions that were just wrong and was really headstrong uh, about area bombing. He was kind of the foil to the bomber mafia of the Americans.
he was arguably, as it says here, pretty sadistic, and he just wanted to basically, uh, you know, flatten these cities to rubble. Uh, when asked what morality was, I define a moral bombing action uh, as one that brings advantage to my friend Winston Churchill because he had already defined a moral action as one that brings advantage to my friends. Uh, and that's, you know, he saw things in, in that kind of way. And yeah, so there was a big difference between the American approach to bombing and, and the British approach. Shortly after taking over British bombing operations, Bomber Harris launched a massive attack on the city of Cologne, uh, a night bombing, because of course they didn't particularly need to see their targets, did they? Harris sent 1,000 bombers into Germany and they dropped their bombs everywhere. In the end, the RAF campaign leveled 90% of central Cologne, 600 acres in all. More than 3,000 homes were destroyed. Once during the war, the story goes, Harris was stopped for speeding. The policeman said, sir, you're traveling much too fast. You might kill someone. Harris replied, now that you mention it, it's my business to kill people. Germans, he said. So the really headstrong and indignant approach to, to what they were doing in the face of much more sens sensible, rational um, you know, decision-making and choices. Yeah. So it continues later, ostensibly, so it continues here. Years later, in 1977, he was interviewed by the British Forces Broadcasting Services, uh, and he had had 30 years to think about his actions. But when he spoke about one of his most infamous missions, when his bombers reduced the city of Dresden to rubble, there was no remorse. Well, of course, people are apt to say, oh, poor Dresden, that lovely city, solely engaged in producing beautiful little China shepherdesses with frilly skirts. But as a matter of fact, it was the last viable governing centre for Germany. And also, it was virtually the last way through from north to south from German reserves, moving in front of the Russian and our own army advances. So ostensibly to prevent the movement of troops through Dresden, Harris had his bombers take out 1,600 acres of the city's core and killed 25,000 civilians over the course of three days. So rather than take out bridges and take out the actual mode of transportation or, or the, the routes of transportation, just flatten the city and killed all those, those innocent civilians. Um, when asked why he targeted civilians instead of military installations, Harris challenged the question. We weren't aiming, and this is really, really important, and again, this is what Russia are doing as well. We weren't aiming particularly at the civilian population. We were aiming at the production of everything that made it possible for the German armies to continue the war. That was the whole idea of the bombing offensive, including, as I said, the destruction of facilities for building submarines and the armament industries through Germany and the people who worked in them. They were all active soldiers, to my mind. People who worked in the production of munitions must expect to be treated as active soldiers. Otherwise, where do you draw the line? And you could add here that the Russians might see pretty much everyone as as potential or as active soldiers in that kind of way. Um, they were all active soldiers to my mind. Children, mothers, the elderly, nurses in hospital, pastors in churches. When you make the leap to say that we will no longer try to aim at something specific, you then you cross a line. So this is what Malcolm Gladwell is saying. Then you have to convince yourself that there is no difference between a soldier on the one hand and children and mothers and nurses in the hospital on the other. The whole argument of the bomber mafia, the whole reason for being, was that they didn't want to cross that line. They were just advancing a technological argument. They were also advancing a moral argument about how to wage war. The most important fact about Carl Norden said, this is a guy that, that invented the bomb site that allowed you to do that precision bombing that meant you can take out the road, you can take out the bridge, you can take out that, that factory that is making those munitions rather than destroy the whole neighbourhood in the hope that you might get that factory. Now, I, and I would, I would, dispute how Gladwell frames this, but the most important fact about Carl Norden, the godfather of precision bombing, is not that he was a brilliant engineer or a hopeless eccentric, it's, what, it's that he was a devoted Christian. I would change that to say he was a devoted moralist or someone who's strongly driven by morality, because I see myself as strongly driven by morality, and I'm not Christian, I'm not, I'm not, a theist i'm an atheist right but i think all of many of us not all of us at all because clearly that's not the case but many of us are, are driven by our sense of morality right where no matter what we believe so that there is something to say about our upbringing or our, or our dna quite precisely as well uh, our environment uh, uh, you know all of this comes together to produce us as moral individuals and for this chap um 
Carl Norden, it was his Christianity that 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 facilitated him doing that or, or was one of the ways that, that it manifested itself. So as the, his morality through that, as historian Stephen McFarlane puts it, you might wonder if he thought he was being in service to humanity, why he would develop sites for people to drop bombs. And the reason was because he was a true believer that by making bombing accuracy better, he would save lives. He truly believed what the army and navy were telling him, and that is that we're going to destroy machines of war, not the people of war. We're not going to do like we did in World War One, where we slaughtered millions of soldiers. We're not going to try to slaughter millions of civilians. We're only going to try to blow up factories and blow up machines of war. And he bought into that. And that was part of his basic philosophy of it philosophy of life is Christianity. So then the book is, I presume, going to look at, you know, how he developed this, his obsession with developing this bomb site that that wasn't immediately sort of picked up by everyone. As you can see, the RAF were still intent on doing this area morale bombing. Uh, and and I I find this like a foreshadowing, maybe, or well, not even a foreshadowing. I think this is possibly, it'd be interesting to see whether this kind of thinking is actually, was directly incorporated into the US Air Force and military doctrine. Because you're seeing now, uh, maybe it took time to, to refine this idea, but you're seeing now, and I've said this before, that the US are putting a lot more store in precision guided munitions and so and this won't be accurate but the the kind of ballpark would be that they've got you know 10 percent dumb munitions and 90 percent precision munitions because yes there are times when you want to use dumb munitions but actually it's it's much more sensible to use precision guided munitions you're using less stuff one it's a shell can do the job of 20 other shells being walked in uh, so it may be more expensive, but actually, when you add up all those shells, is it more expensive? But also, you're just blowing up the thing you want to blow up. There's no collateral damage. You're not so you can talk about civilians, or you can talk about your own troops. So there's an argument to say that you don't often want your troops too close to where you're going to hit because circle error probable and being able to hit your own troops accidentally is 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 a, too, too much of a risk. But actually, if you're using something like Excalibur, you can bring your troops closer, hit them, hit the target, and then your troops can overrun the position or whatever. So there's a lot of really good reason, a lot of good rationale why you should use this kind of like the rational arguments for using precision guided munition against like this this intuitive belief that is arguably not right. Well, it's not, it is not correct. The intuitive belief that we just blitz everyone and then they'll lose the lose the will. Actually, no, they, they won't. And the blitz has told us that. And, and it's just really tremendously wasteful uh, in in so many ways. But I, I was just reading this and I thought there's so much in what I'm reading that is pertinent to what we are seeing in Ukraine and, and the different approaches. It's almost like the Russians have the RAF approach, the original RAF approach, and, and the Ukrainians taking on you know, NATO doctrine are, are more like the the Americans here uh, as they were at the beginning or or some way through World War II. Let me know what you think. Was this interesting? I don't know. This this is just fanciful for me, but um, I don't know. It's just I was quite excited reading this. That I, I just wanted to share it with you because that's what I'm like, a bit of a tigger. Uh, but uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you for listening. Take care. I'll speak to you soon.